about eight years ago, I began running. Now, some people wouldn't call what I do running. Some people would call what I do jogging. Some real big time runners would call what I do very fast walking. I don't care what you call it, I call it running. About eight years ago, I started running and had a friend and he says, hey, if we're gonna run, we need to run in some races. So we began preparing for what is known as the Peachtree Road Race. It's a very large race. There's 50,000 people that run in this race every year on July 4th. Never have I run in a more enjoyable race than this race on 4th of July, the Peachtree Road Race. From the second you start to the last step that you finish, there are hundreds and hundreds of people cheering you on. Yes, there are 50,000 people running, but there are people you have never met, you will never see them again, and they're there cheering you on. You have people there, they're cheering you. Come on, you're almost there, you're almost there, you can do it. This morning, I want to come alongside of you and encourage you in the race of life. I want to come along and cheer you. Hey, there are going to be some big hills you're going to have to climb in life. There are going to be some times where you wonder, can I make it? There are going to be some times where you just say, enough already. I'm just going to quit. I want to come and encourage you. This is life. And this really matters. And just as Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 says, let us lay aside every weight and sin which does so easily beset us and run the race with patience that is set before us. Life is compared to a battle. And all of us are in a war, a battle. And today I want to come and encourage you, hey, we as believers of Jehovah God, we as his followers must fight the good fight of faith. We must war a good warfare so when we stand before Christ, he says, well done. We come to 2 Samuel chapter 23. When God performs a special task and raises up a man to perform a special task, he also raises up great men around him to strengthen his hands and to encourage him in the task that God has called him to do. Some of these men that he raises up get the spotlight. Many go unnoticed and are never given the spotlight that they deserve. Such was the case with King David. He could have never won all of the victories that he won if it were not for his mighty men. His mighty men were men that were committed to their king, that wanted to serve their king, that were willing to die for their king if need be. He had 30 men. Now, as they died, they were replaced. That's why in 2 Samuel 23, there's 37 listed. He had 30 mighty men who helped him be all that he could be in life. So in 2 Samuel 23, he is reflecting on success. He is reflecting on all of the victories that God has given him. And he cannot reflect on the victories that God has given him without remembering his 30 mighty men. Now, after the 30, there was a specific group of three men who were extraordinarily valiant, who were incredibly courageous, who stood when everyone else left. In verse 8, we see the first one is a dino. He killed 800 men with a spear. The next we see is Eliezer on the list. And he stood for his king and with his king when everyone else left. Eliezer stood when he was tired. Eliezer stood when he was weary. Eliezer stood when he didn't feel like standing anymore. He stood and fought for his king. And the third one we find is Shammah who defended a field of lentils. 
Lentils are nothing more than peas. So he stood and he fought the Philistines over a field of peas. You say, why? Why fight over a field of peas? Well, it was a good place. It was, it was a good area to grow crops. It was a giving place. They had a great harvest, but the reason he fought over this field, it was a given place. God had given them this land. His king had entrusted him this land, and he was going to stand up and fight for what had been given to him. There are many things in our lives that we've been given. There are many good things that we've been given by the Lord. There are many growing things that we've been given by the Lord. And you and I should stand up and defend those things. Things like the family. Things like marriage. Things like holiness. Things like God's Word. I want you to see seven lessons from the battlefield in a sermon entitled, Stay in the Battle. The first lesson we see, when attacked by the enemy, stay in the battle. Now, all three of these men were attacked by their enemy, the Philistines. This was war, and their enemy wanted to destroy them. Now, their job was to serve their king and to defend their king whenever a need arose. But they were attacked. They were doing what they were supposed to be doing, and they were attacked. Now, they could have said, wait a minute. We're being faithful to God. Wait a minute. We are serving the king. Wait a minute. We are doing what God would have us to do. Why are we being attacked? But listen, attacks come because they were soldiers. And the same is true with you and I. We will be attacked as Christians because we are soldiers for Christ. Second. Timothy chapter 3 verse 12 says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Peter said it like this in 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. Peter says, hey, don't think it's unusual. Don't say, man, I'm serving the Lord. I'm doing what's right. I am where I'm supposed to be in God's will. Why am I being attacked? Peter says, if you're a soldier, you're going to be attacked. Don't think it's strange. Don't think it's peculiar. Don't think that God has something out for you. If you're a soldier, you're going to be attacked. Now, I want you to notice a great example of this. You're in 2 Samuel chapter 23. Turn over to 1 Samuel chapter 17. You say, where will the attack come from? Well, the attack comes from the devil, but yet he uses many different people to bring attack to you when you're doing what God would have you to do. Now, get the scene, and you know this is an old familiar story. The children of Israel are camped there on a hillside. The Philistines are camped on another hillside, and Goliath comes out and challenges the children of Israel. Now, this was not their battle. This was the Lord's battle. And so the Lord was going to bring them victory but the children of Israel were not focused on the Lord. They were focused on Goliath and how big and how bad and how courageous Goliath was. So Goliath comes out and he's taunting the children of Israel. When lo and behold comes little David. Little innocent David who believed in his God. He comes and he says, who is this guy to talk about our God like this? I'll go, I'll go and fight him. Notice what his family had to say to David. 1 Samuel 17, verse 28. And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spoke unto the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, Why camest thou down hither? 
And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? Now listen to what he says. I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. That was attack. David was doing what he was supposed to be doing. David was doing what God would have him to do. David was serving the Lord with a pure heart. And he was attacked by his family. And listen, you're going to be attacked as well. It's not strange. It's not peculiar. It's going to come. Many times it had come from a family member. But not only did it come from his family, it also came from his friends. Word got to Saul and Saul called him in. And notice what Saul says to David in chapter 17, verse 33. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go up against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. His friend, his leader, his hero. Saul says, David, great. I'm glad that you believe in God. But David, you're not, you're not experienced enough. David, you're not mature enough. David, you don't have the background to fight a Goliath. Even his own friend, his hero, did not believe in him. And there are going to be times when you're serving the Lord. There are going to be times when you're doing what you're supposed to be doing and your friends will say things that they shouldn't say and they will attack you. Well, David convinces Saul to let him go. He heads out to Goliath. Notice verse 43. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his God. He faced attacks from his family. He faced an attack from his friends. He faced an attack from Goliath. But that did not get his focus off of God. If you were to read the next few verses, David says, no, 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 no. God will deliver thee into my hand. His focus was on God. Listen, my friend, when attacked, stay in the battle. Don't think it's strange. Don't say, man, what's going on with me? I'm serving the Lord. Why am I being attacked? When attacked, stay in the battle. Back in 2 Samuel chapter 23, look at verse 11. And after him was Shammah, the son of Ag, the Herorite. And the Philistines were gathered together into a troop where was a piece of ground full of lentils. The Philistines attacked at the time of harvest. Well, why attack at harvest? Because they weren't expecting it. Because they were rejoicing over the good things. Because they were saying, hey, God's been good to us. Look at all these blessings that we have. Man, God is blessing us. And many times in mountaintop experiences, many times when we are being blessed abundantly is when the devil comes in and attacks us. Another reason I think they were attacked at harvest time, to destroy their very livelihood. This was their livelihood. They lived off of these peas, and they wanted to destroy their livelihood. And same is true with you many times when the devil comes and attacked. He's going to attack in your area of strength because he wants to destroy you. Can I encourage you today? Can I cheer you on today? When attacked, stay in the battle. Second lesson we learn, when outnumbered by the opposition, stay in the battle. Now notice verse 8. The same was Adino, the Esnite. He leapt of his spear against 800, whom he slew at one time. 800 came to do battle with Adino. Do you think he would run? Not on your life. He raised his spear and he fought and won, but don't be confused. God gave him the victory. Look at verse 9. Eliezer, the son of Dodah, the Ahoahite, one of the three mighty men with David, when they defied the Philistines, they were gathered together to battle. And the men of Israel were gone away. He was outnumbered. The men of Israel had gone. They literally had turned and ran. He was there, but even though he was outnumbered, he fought on anyway. Look at verse 11. 
And the Philistines were gathered together into a troop where was a piece of ground full of lentils, and the people fled from the Philistines. All three of these men stood their ground, even though they were outnumbered, because they weren't focused on the enemy. They were focused on their God. And there will be many, many, many times in your life when you will be outnumbered, when you will say, wait, there's no way whatsoever I can get through this financial situation. There's no way ever I can get through this problem or this difficulty. The enemy is too great. There's too many of them. Can I encourage you today? When outnumbered, stay in the battle. Noah was outnumbered. Gideon was outnumbered. 300 men against 135,000 Midianites outnumbered 450 to 1. Joshua was outnumbered. Elijah was outnumbered. 700 prophets of Baal to Elijah. My friend, in battle, in the war that you're going through today, don't throw in the towel. Don't say, there's too many. I'm outnumbered when outnumbered by the opposition, stay in the battle. The third lesson we learn, when deserted by your comrades, stay in the battle. Now notice verse 9. And the men of Israel were gone away. Look at verse 11. And the people fled from the Philistines. One of the reason of Eleazar and Shammah's greatness, they did not flee when deserted in the face of battle. That's the time for courage to be displayed. Now think about it. You're out fighting. It is a tough fight. And then all of your friends forsake you. They all say, wait a minute. This is getting too hot. Wait a minute. I don't know if we're going to win. And all of your friends leave you. What are you going to do in that matter? What are you going to do at that moment? Teenager, you will have to stand alone if you stand for right. Dad, you will have to stand alone if you stand for right. But if you're standing for right, you're not standing alone. You're standing with God. So let me encourage you. Have your friends abandoned you? Those that you thought were your comrades, have they fled? Stay in the battle. Don't flee when deserted by your comrades. Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, This thou knowest, that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, he says, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16, Paul says, at my first answer, my first hearing, no man stood with me. All men forsook me. That's part of war. That's part of the battle, is not everyone is going to stand with you when you're standing for right. Can I encourage you? Can I come and cheer you on? When forsaken by your comrades, when deserted, when they leave you fighting all by yourself. Stay in the battle. Fourth lesson we learn, when overwhelmed with exhaustion, stay in the battle. Notice verse 10. He arose and smote the Philistines, notice this, until his hand was weary. Verse 10. His hand was tired. Here he is. He's fighting and fighting and fighting. He's fighting because he believes in his king. He's fighting because there is a cause. He's fighting, but he's tired. He is totally exhausted. He didn't go and say, you know what? I'm just tired. I'm going to sit down. Wait, wait, wait. That's not all of it. Look on in verse 10. Until his hand was weary... And his hand clave unto the sword. He had been fighting for so long. His hand was hurting. The muscles had tightened up so he could not even release the sword. He was in pain. He was totally exhausted. But he kept fighting. Can you see him after the battle trying to pry his hand off of that sword? Why did he fight when he was tired? Why did he fight when he was hurting? 
there was a cause. There was a cause to fight for. Why did he fight? Because victory was near. Why did he fight? Because the enemy was real. Why did he fight? Because the next generation needed him to fight. Can I tell you? There are times in this life you and I are going to get tired. There are going to be times we are totally exhausted. There are going to be some times where our hand is cleaving to the sword and we're hurting when totally exhausted. Stay in the battle. You say, why? Why should we stay in the battle when we're tired, when we're hurting? Because there's a cause. There is a cause and you're fighting not just for yourself. You're fighting for God's kingdom. Stay in the battle. You stay in the battle because victory is near. You stay in the battle because we're not fighting for victory. We're fighting from victory. God is going to give us the victory. We're just defending his land. We stay in the battle when we're tired because there's a real enemy. And if we sit down and we just say, well, I don't feel good, so I'm just going to sit this one out, then the enemy's going to come in like a flood and spoil our country and spoil our children and spoil our churches. Why do we fight when we're tired? Why do we fight when we're hurting? Because the next generation needs us to. The only way the next generation is going to receive the truth of Scripture is if we stand and defend it with all of our might. In this age of ease, in this age of flabbiness, how quickly we grow tired. Can I encourage you? When totally exhausted, just like Eliezer, stay in the battle. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9, Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. When totally exhausted, stay in the battle. The fifth lesson we learn, when unnoticed by everyone, stay in the battle. When unnoticed by everyone, stay in the battle. Really, we know very little of these three men save these brief sentences. Nothing is said of them elsewhere. There is a parallel passage in 1 Chronicles chapter 11 that says basically the same thing as 1 Samuel 23. Other than that, we know nothing of these three men. Now think about it. David had 30 mighty men. They had to do great feats as well, and we don't know about them. All we know about is their names. When unnoticed by everyone, stay in the battle. When no one sings your praises, and when no one writes a song about your feats, and no one writes a poem about what you've done, remember, there is no job so insignificant. There is no person so inconspicuous that God doesn't notice. Do you want the praise of men or do you want the praise of God? When no one notices, stay in the battle. The sixth lesson we learn, when commissioned by the king, stay in the battle. Now, why would these men stay and fight against such odds? Can I give you two reasons? The first one, they were commissioned by their king. Their king had said, hey, God has promised us this land. You go and you fight. They had a commission by their king, and they went and they fought for their king, whom they believed in, whom they loved, because he had given them a commission. Oh, but wait a minute, friend. You and I have been given a commission as well. Matthew 28, verse 18, Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Why did they fight against such great odds? because they were commissioned by their king. And that's the reason you should stand. That's the reason you shouldn't throw in the towel. That's the reason you say, wait a minute, there's too many of them. No, nope. 
because you and I have been commissioned by our king, we must stay in the battle. But the second reason I believe they stayed in the battle, they stayed in the battle because they love their king. They love their king. Now let me show you this. Look down, 2 Samuel 23, look at verse 13. And three of the thirty chief went down and came to David in the harvest time unto the cave of Adullam. And the troop of the Philistines pitched in the valley of Rephaim. And David was then in a hold, and the garrison of the Philistines was then in Bethlehem. Verse 15. And David longed and said, Oh, that one would give me drink of the water of the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. These three men, they're there with their king who had commissioned them, whom they love. And he's just reminiscing. He's like, oh, oh, I remember the, the well in Bethlehem. How great a well that was. Oh, I would love to have some of that water. His boys, his mighty men says, if our king wants it, even though he didn't ask us to get it, even though he was just kind of remembering, let's go and fight through the armies of the Philistines, get him that water and bring it back to our king. Why would they do that? They fight through armies. They risk their life not for an order, not for a request, for just a king's desire. Why would they do that? Because they loved their king. You say, why should we stand and fight when we're outnumbered? Why should we stand and defend what is right when we're attacked? Why should we stand and defend when we're abandoned and deserted by our comrades? Why should we defend when no one notices us? Because we love Jesus. Because we have a king who's worthy to die for, who's worthy to serve, when attacked, stay in the battle. When deserted by your comrades, stay in the battle. When no one notices, so stay in the battle. When totally exhausted, stay in the battle. Number six, when commissioned by the king, stay in the battle. And finally, when promised victory, stay in the battle. You don't have to turn. If you were to turn to Leviticus chapter 25, verse 23, you would notice that God had promised these people victory. He had promised them the land. They were to go in and drive out the enemy, and the Lord was going to give them the land. Now notice verse 12, 2 Samuel 23, verse 12. He stood in the midst of the ground and defended it and slew the Philistines. And the Lord wrought a great victory. The Lord did it. It wasn't a dino. It wasn't Shama. It wasn't Eliezer. The Lord brought a great victory. Don't miss the point. It was God that gave them the victory. So it wasn't them saying, oh no, how will we ever beat this multitude? How will we ever overcome these odds? Nope. They were focused on their God who had promised them victory. But wait a minute. God has promised us victory as well. Romans chapter 8, verse 37. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. You know, no one who abandoned Eliezer and Shammah, they're not listed in the Bible, nowhere to be found. But these men who, in the midst of great attack, these men who stood when everyone forsook them, these men who stood when no one noticed, they're recognized. Not a lot of recognition, but they're recognized. And their reward will be great in heaven because they serve the Lord here. I can see David thinking about the accomplishments of his life. I can see him thanking the Lord for his generosity and his many, many, many blessings. And David, I can see him tearing up. He says, uh-oh, I don't deserve all of the credit that, that has been given to me. 
You see, there were a lot of mighty men who stood unnoticed and fought. A lot of mighty men who stood valiantly against incredible odds. A lot of mighty men who deserved the credit and not me because they did what was right. Can I encourage you this morning? Can I come alongside and cheer you on in the race of life? Can I come along and cheer you on in the battle of life? When attacked, stay in the battle. When deserted by your comrades, stay in the battle. When outnumbered by the opposition, stay in the battle. When totally exhausted, stay in the battle. When unnoticed by everyone, stay in the battle. When, when commissioned by the king, stay in the battle. And when promised victory, stay in the battle. You say, why? Because there's a cause. Why? Because war is real. Why? Because the enemy is real. Why? Because the next generation needs you. How do we become a mighty man or a mighty woman? Serving where God has placed you in spite of the opposition. Wherever you find yourself, wherever God puts you, no matter what the opposition, you serve faithfully and God will do the rest. Can I encourage you? Stay in the battle. We have a God who's real. We have a God who cares for you and He is going to protect you. He is going to defend you. Don't flee. Don't run don't forsake the battle, stay in the battle.